Wells, Brad, thanks so much for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. Super, super excited to have you both on. We are super, super, super excited to be here, man. (laughs) Great topic. I know a lot of coaches are going to listen to this, obviously, because of you both. But I know an awful lot more who don't know about your background and maybe based somewhere else are going to listen to this based off the title of the podcast, which is basically the role of resilience and coaching resilience. Um, it's a it's a hot topic over the last five, 10 years, parenting, coaching, teaching, uh, kids today are changing, blah, blah, blah. So we're going to get into that today. Um, the first question is probably the million dollar one. And that would be, I'll start with you, Wells. How would you define resilience to for players today in the game? Um, yeah, it's a great question, man. I think uh, resilience is is grit, is is sticking through it when things get tough. Um, you know, for me and my career, I think although we um, we understand that success isn't a straight path, and it's a lot of uh, crisscross and a lot of ups and a lot of downs. Subconsciously, you know, when you when we see pros, we think kind of their path is easy. Um, and mine was anything but you know, never making any, an ODP team, uh, drugs and alcohol almost ravaged my life as a kid. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these things, uh, taught me, um, a lot of lessons and prepared me when I got to Wake Forest as a, as a, as a walk on. So as a walk on to Wake Forest, I basically wasn't getting recruited, um, uh, by many colleges because of my past and history with drugs and alcohol. I grew up five minutes from the campus um, but to me, resilience is really just kind of sticking, sticking to it, sticking through it, um, no matter what comes your way. Brad, what have you got? Yeah, you know, so so there's the the uh, standard psychologist definition. So I'll do my part to start with that. Right? It's like you adapt well to adversity and trauma and those things. And I kind of like a, a little deeper definition that really focuses on. Sometimes there's this idea if you're resilient, it means you're not phased by much. You kind of brush it off. You just kind of, you know, go through it and you're okay, right? You bounce back quick. And that is a big part of resilience. But I think a part that's not really talked about or addressed is that, you know, being resilient doesn't mean that you always feel comfortable. You always feel confident. You always feel like you're in problem solving mode. You know, it's sort of dealing with being overwhelmed, right? With being anxious, losing some confidence, having doubt, not knowing what to do, but you persevere, like Wells said, you persevere and you hang in there despite feeling uncomfortable and scared and not knowing what to do. And you hang in there long enough to switch your brain out of threat mode into challenge mode. And now you're trying to figure, okay, what can I do? And that resilience requires vulnerability, right? I don't have all the answers, but I'm gonna try to figure it out. Maybe some things from my past can help me, but there's also other people I can go to. And that resilient is being able to get that support from those around you and then figure out, stick with it long enough to where you can push through those setbacks and kind of eventually overcome that adversity. So sometimes resilience, it's like, oh, that person's not phased, right? There's a healthy version of just not being phased by something, meaning you've gone through it enough, you've trained your brain, just you're, you're familiar with making a mistake, having a setback, and here's how I go about it. That's the healthy version. The unhealthy version of sort of not being phased by something is being numb, right? And just sort of like, oh, I don't really connect with my emotions, I don't connect with my feelings, and I can just kind of go like a robot. And that does work in moments, but it's got a whole lot of side effects. So when we talk about resilience, I really want people to know Sometimes we are most resilient when we feel most weak, right? When we're really just not sure what to do, but we hang in there long enough. And to me, the most resilient people I've been around professionally or personally are those people who go through it, can be vulnerable and hang in there long enough and persevere to find the roadmap to go forward for themselves and other people. So I just want to highlight for the people listening that being in a state of not knowing and uncertainty and feeling weak emotionally is often where we may be at our strongest because we stick with it. I mean, it's, it's interesting because you come at it from two different angles. Uh, you know, Wells is you know, with with your own personal history there and your own personal journey, and then Brad with the I suppose with the research and with the I suppose the global picture of what it is. It leads me to think that it's it's obviously very complex. And I had I had moved into my second question, which was going to be around where I thought coaches found it more complex. 
And it wasn't actually the definition of it. Where I thought coaches found it more complex was how to actually build it in their players. What what are some ways do you think that, you know, everyone's going to say, yeah, I agree with both of you. Like, this is a positive thing. We need to grow on this. We need to develop it. What's the starting point or what are some ways coaches can do that? Yeah, I'll lead us off again, Brad, and then you, Dr. Brad, and then you take us away. I think, you know, I think the first thing is to, you know, the, there's four pillars of U.S. soccer. It's technical, tactical, physical, and mental, right? So I think the first thing that needs to to kind of be addressed is um, just talking about it, right? Like bringing it up, like understanding. And I think, again, so like we sit back and we say, duh, you know, our minds affect our performance, affect um, everything about us, right? But, um, you know, just kind of a realization for me is how often I train my body as a pro. And it was every day, right? sometimes multiple times a day. Um, but how often I train my mind and it was practically zero. And so like the older I get, you know, <laughs> the more kids I have, I'm like, my mind is really like, that's where it, where it comes from, right? Like how I feel, how I process things, um, what I focus on. It's really kind of the, the rudder in the ship, right? Um, so for me, I think it's just, it, it's addressing it. It's bringing it up. It's, uh, it's, it's starting the discussion with other coaches, with your team, um, just kind of bringing it to the forefront. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways, just like there's a lot of ways to define it. There's a lot of ways to build resilience and kind of where do we start? I think a really big point is that, and I think this is where coaches can do such a great job is coaches want to normalize the struggles that we're going to have in the mental side, right? There's struggles we're going to have in the, in the physical side, right? You're talking to them, Hey, you're going to be sore. And you come back the next day. What do you do for soreness? Hey, sometimes technically you're struggling, right? What do you do to improve your first touch, you know, to kind of pass quicker, you know, to kind of your one-on-one defending. And so when I think of resilience is we want to talk to kids and say, Hey, here's the expectation. You are going to have setbacks. You're going to have struggles. This is part of the process and you don't want to fear them. You don't want to dread them. This is part of what the experience is. If anybody chooses to try to get better at something and improve at something, you're absolutely going to have setbacks and adversity individually and collectively as the team. So we want to put that out there and say, this is the reality. And there are tools and strategies we can all use individually and collectively to help us. So I think the first part is normalizing that if a coach is willing to be vulnerable and say, hey, guys, this is what my career was like. This is what playing was like for me. I remember those times and those big moments and those big games when sometimes my anxiety got the best of me. You know what I mean? I wasn't able to kind of focus and play as much as I can. So coaches who can share some vulnerability and acknowledge that kind of normalizes it and says, oh, it's okay to talk about this. Right. And so when we talk about that, those are some of the struggles that players are going to have. Now there's an atmosphere that's a little bit safer that they can go, yeah, I get stressed, coach, when you put me at left back. I'm the center back. Why are you doing that? Or, hey, coach, I get stressed when it's the second half and you put me back, you know, in holding mid and say, don't let them score. We got to finish this out and get three points. Right? If they can tell you that, you go, yeah, exactly. Your brain is wired to notice the negative. Your brain is wired to protect you from any danger, physical or emotional. So, of course, you're going to have that stress. And then here's some things you can practically do. So I really think coaches who can be vulnerable, share those experiences and say, okay, so here's sort of the norm you're going to have. Now, what do we do? Right? So then you tell players, what do we do instead? Okay, well, we can focus on, we can spend a lot of time and maybe I don't want to go too far in the rabbit hole here, but what can they do? Players can learn to have the mindset is on the process of focusing on them, right? The the control of controllables, those things we always hear. How do I focus on the process of being better? If I'm in for 15 minutes, the full game, whatever the stage of the game is, what can I do in these next five, 10 minutes to be better, right? How can I get myself to work hard, right? I'm going to anticipate. I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to have a setback. And here's my plan. I mean, they can go next play, next play, next play, or it's like recover, 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 and let me get back behind the ball to support my team. But making sure players have some strategies to use. Typically, it's like, hey, just tough it up and go. Okay, but how do I do that? And what happens when I'm not in the headspace where I can just suck it up and go, right? I need tools and strategies. So I think coaches who can lay the foundation be vulnerable and coaches who can come along and say, I've gone through some of these struggles. There's tools and strategies. 
here's some places to go find them. If you happen to have soccer resilience come alongside your club and we're there, we can talk to you specifically. Or if your team has got, you know, someone who comes in to give you those tools. But kids need to know that there are tools that exist and where to try to find them. Um, so I think that's what a coach does, but lays the foundation. This is part of the discussion, right, about, hey, guys, so we're going to have moments in a game where we're not doing well, where we're struggling, we're taking it on the chin. How do we as a team collectively recover? What does that look like? How do that individually? So I think a coach who lays that expectation and allows that space to happen is a huge part of building some resilience for kids. Mm. Coaching and parenting have changed in recent years with more awareness. Uh, we talked a little bit about this just before we start recording. With more awareness, we're perhaps inadvertently shaping environments that lack these challenges, uh, lack setbacks. Brad, you just mentioned there about soreness. Now you see people trying to avoid physical uh, <laughs> challenges, you know, like roll out 50 times a week so you don't get sore. Whereas 30 years ago, 20 years ago, it was part of the game. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on this video here. Uh, short conversation between Rio Ferdinand and Joe Cole. And then I'll ask a question as soon as it's over. It's, it's about having that character, about yeah. having that belief in yourself and not letting that one person or situation really knock you off your, your target of getting to become a professional footballer because there are going to be bad moments. Understand that and appreciate that there are them moments, but it's how you come back and get yourself back on that on that bike. Do you know what as well, Ree? What I think as well, uh, the academy system is top class, but I think there's a lot of protection. Let them have the bad moments. Mm. Don't don't molly coddle. Let them have them because cause, cause the, the, the diamonds get made by years and years of, of pressure. And, and, and that kid, he would have seen the pressure thinking this, maybe that's not for me. And it's made him dig his heels in and become the player he is today. Listen, if you don't create young people with resilience, you don't create young people that can play football yeah. at this kind of level. What, what's the phrase? Failure isn't the opposite of success. It's the journey yeah. to being successful. Like it, Jake. Like Thanks it. Thanks very much. That's your input for the day. Well done. Thank you. All right. So question is, Wells, your journey to the... A uh, professional game, a nine-year professional, is so unorthodox and so uh, anomaly that people are usually blue chip players coming through the college ranks and into pro. Do we have a situation? Um, and feel free to agree, disagree with me, please. Do we have a situation where young players are not exposed to enough uh, setbacks to gain that resilience? And does it hold back our development of young players? If so. So I love uh, what they said, that the only way to grow grit and perseverance is we have to go through difficulties, right? People want people to be able to persevere, but they don't want people to go through struggles. So you have to go through that, right? That is how you grow grit. That's how you grow perseverance. So we absolutely need those challenges. And you're right, especially with youth soccer today, parents are like, wait, my kid isn't starting. My kid doesn't play the exact position. My kid's team is in the finals of these tournaments and they want to take the kid and they club hop, right? Year to year. And it's always like, I want my kid to be uncomfortable. The coach isn't nice to my kid. The uh, players aren't, you know, and it's this lack of building that resilience. So in order to build that resilience, we have to let kids go through setbacks and struggles, right? Because now we're more motivated. It's kind of like, I think of my recipe for success, Gary, would be Three cups improvement, one cup setback. Three cups improvement, one cup setback. That I'm a firm believer that you need a cup of setback for every three cups of improvement because now you've grabbed my attention. If you're my coach and we start the season off 12-0 and 0 and you come to practice next week, I'm kind of like thinking, I mean, do we really well have to work that hard? I mean, I know Coach Gary's kind of got it set up, but I mean, let's face it, we're crushing it here, right? But when we get it handed to us one week and we struggle and we go through a hardship the next week, it's like, I don't like how that felt, coach. I don't like that the team was blown by me. I don't like that I kept making mistakes and turning the ball over. Now I'm more motivated to try to improve, right? We need to be uncomfortable to motivate us to improve. It would be great, Gary, if the biggest motivator for us was reward. I want to be the best ever. But you know what's really the biggest motivator for us is cost. When I feel that feeling of like, I didn't help my team I'm not playing as much. I'm not earning playing time. That motivates me to go, well, I want that. How do I get that? And now I've got more motivation. So we need setbacks in order to add more tools, right? And I'm going to learn more strategies. Maybe I come to you and go, coach, why aren't you playing? You're like, Brad, your first touch. It gets away from you. It's not dependable. So how could I do that? And now I'm more motivated to practice that. 
So if I have setbacks along the season, I've acquired new skills and abilities I would not have had if it was all improvement, 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 improvement. And then the mental side, my brain has now been trained like, yeah, Brad, sometimes you don't get to play as much. Sometimes you struggle and you can get through it and you can figure it out. So my tolerance for being frustrated and discomfort has gotten better. I can manage it better emotionally because I've shown myself I can get through it. I'm a very big proponent. We need setbacks. We don't have to artificially create them, but if we let kids have life, they will absolutely go through them. Yeah, I mean, this question hits home to me. I mean, as you would say, Gary, I thought what Rhea said was brilliant. Um, it's so true. And it's like, yeah, duh, right? Like, yeah, of course we need setbacks. And so as a parent, you know, like you don't know what you don't know. And my, my oldest son is playing baseball and he's re- like, he's probably the worst player on the team. And so I've shared a lot of this stuff with Brad and like before we went through this, this experience, I was like, I don't care what he does. I just want to be happy. And I'm like, the reality of that is I'm really struggling because my son is not is not grabbing onto things as quickly as I, as I did, or, or, or like into it as much as me. He just, he's social. He's like that, you know, have fun and, and, and make friends, that sort of thing. And I'm out there like freaking out, you know, I'm like, Oh my God, I need to talk to the coach. He's not, he's sitting him. Why is he sitting him? You know? And so like, I'm, I'm making fun of myself there, but that's how I feel because as, and Brad would explain this to you, but like, I'm flipping my lid. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a very emotional human being as it is. And so, um, you know, seeing my son and that makes it so hard for parents. Right. Um, Yes, we know that our kids need to experience setbacks and difficulties because they're going to come out on the other side stronger. Right. And I don't know much, but I do know one thing and is that we're all facing challenges and difficulties. And if we're coming out of one, we're going back into one Um, and, and those sorts of things. So, you know, in my personal journey, like I tried out for the North Carolina ODP team for years and I never made it. And, uh, um, when I was 16 years old, my life was ravaged drugs and alcohol. My parents had to hire people to kidnap me in the middle of the night and take me away to school. And so, um, I was in the, I was in like a lockdown facility for troubled kids and <laughs> nobody was recruiting me. So from 16 to 18, I was in this facility. Uh, I come home, I repeat my senior year. I didn't, I had some small, some offers for some really good colleges, but small offers. And I wanted to go way away from home. Um, but if you know anything about college soccer, you know, that Wake Forest, um, is a awesome school powerhouse, right. In soccer in the last 20 years and a phenomenal education. And so I walked on to Wake and, uh, you know, I look back and see that like the setbacks that I had and the challenges I went through prepared me for that time. Um, you know, Wake was getting the best of the best Gatorade national player of the years, um, high school all Americans, guys that captain the U15, U17 national team. Like, um, and I'm sure they had some setbacks along the way, but for the most part, a lot of guys that just kind of, you know, were the best of the best. And so I, I saw you'd hear you hear about these guys like all summer long, and then they come in and some of them really struggle. It was the first time they had faced true opposition, and I just think it was really hard for them to deal with. I'm speculating a little bit, but I see that, you know, me and Brad talk about this this a lot, but the obstacles aren't roadblocks to the way they are the way, right. They, they make us stronger individuals and, and help us build up that resilience. So, you know, and I would say, you said my story is a little bit of an anomaly. Um, like I, I, I got a podcast too, and we were talking to Steve Ralston. He's the, um, second all-time leader in MLS, uh, for assists. He didn't start as a senior in high school. And he went to a community college, like just his story is crazy. And then I talked to Matt Pickens a couple of weeks ago and he went to a community college and then went on to play for 15 years in the MLS. And like, I mean, think about Alfonso Davies grew up in a refugee camp in Ghana. And now, and then he just won the, uh, what did that, what, you know, you know what he won. I mean, he, at 18 years old, starting for Bayern Munich, winning the Champions League. Um, so I think the stories are probably more, and everybody knows Michael Jordan, right? He didn't make his team. And so, um, you know, I think those, those setbacks really, they can define careers because, um, you know, for me, it was like, okay, I'm going to fight harder because I really want this and I want to prove it to people when I was driven. Um, but I definitely think that like the trials that I went through as a kid prepared me for, for what I went through. And this is why I'm so passionate about, 
the mental stuff because I believe one of my greatest assets as a player was the mental side of things. Like I was tough, but somewhere along the way, I lost that belief in myself. And it became my greatest detriment. I believe it actually, and I don't say downfall to my career. I had a good career at nine years, but I believe that um, it hindered me from really becoming, as a pro, um, the best I could be. Moving along to something, again, that the coaches talk about through the mental aspect is is leader, like leadership, you know, people who can impact others. And this is a, a actually like a, I'm a massive Roy Keane fan. Um, I would disagree with a lot of what he said on his um, on his platform in terms of his TV work over the last 12 months. There's a few things that have been like, nah, not for me. But actually, I think this here is like one of the greatest conversations that coaching staffs and coaches can have around just different philosophies. So I'm going to play another clip um, and get your thoughts on this here. Uh, Roy Keane talking about Manchester United this weekend. So, Is it not the, the responsibility of the manager to make sure those players are ready from the first minute? Truthfully, no. I don't think so. I'll argue all day with people. The manager's job, of course, he's got to oversee everything. But I never looked at a manager in all my career before the match. And I'm talking about great managers, some bad managers, going back to when I was eight, nine years of age. I never looked at a manager to say, are you going to mo motivate me today? That comes from within. That comes from your, your DNA, what you stand for, your background, your family, your teammates. That doesn't... That... Hard-hitting words from Mr. Keane. Um, this was... Um, I would highly recommend, if you haven't seen the whole thing, uh, I would go and have a look at it on, uh, on, on Sky Sports, on YouTube. Him and Tim Cahill, it's fascinating. Tim Cahill's approach it that Arsenal were well-organised, their tactics were spot-on. And Keane was basically arguing that it's not the coach's responsibility to motivate the players and build that at the, at the senior level. I have a feeling you guys are going to disagree with that, but what's your thoughts on the role of a coach once you're talking? I know you, you guys are doing some work with colleges and, and some, some older players. Once you get to 16, 17, 18, and it becomes, as you've experienced, well, if this becomes a job, this gets real, real quick. Bill's got to be paid. Um, how much responsibility is the coach to impact that environment? But how much responsibility is it for the player to own this and to drive it? You know, in, in a certain sense, I understand what, what Keen's saying. Um, you know, and most of the guys, like, I'll probably safe to say all the guys at that level are driven to an extent, right? Um, yeah, but you know, I, I don't know. I, I disagree. I mean, I think as a, as the coach, you're leading the club. So it's in essence, kind of your responsibility to rally the troops. And so, um, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure that Keen would argue against that. Right. I think that he's, he's probably saying that, um, you know, these guys are driven, but, but no, I believe that, I mean, light look, it's not just about football. Like, you know, holistic's a word kind of thrown around a lot, but, um, you know, the, the last thing we need these days is like experts or gurus. We need human beings. And so for me, and, and everybody's different, right? Like I couldn't take a coach just like battering me with words and yelling at me and saying, you know, you suck and run extra hard or blah, blah, blah. Like I need a little bit of like arm around my shoulders and, 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 encouragement and and that sort of thing and then i would run through a wall with for you like if i understood that you cared about me like i'm good i got you and and for the most part i got you anyway um because you know you try to as a pro you're trying to, to trying to operate that way and you understand that like i mean every practice your job's on the line like you suck in practice well there's 10 guys that are willing to take your position sort of thing uh, back to your original question, it, you know, is he wrong there a little bit? I think so. I think that the the coach is in that position for a reason. And so, um, you know, it's his job and responsibility to get the best out of his players. And so what does that look like? It doesn't look like treating everybody the same way. Um, to me, it looks like getting to know your players. It looks like um, you know, for, going back to kids, it's such an easy comparison, but like my kids are all different. And so I have to, I have to interact with them all in different ways. Um, but again, it's my job to lead them. And yes, I do need to push my kids to like, 
because I, I know what they can become and I need to help them see that. Right. So just kind of acting like, like a guide, but um, yeah, I believe it's the manager's position. That's just kind of his job is to motivate the team to get them prepared for um, whoever they're playing, whenever that is. And so, yeah. Uh, Brad, can I, can I just change your question then? Because yeah, is let's say I, I'm a, I'm a college coach and I've, my job's on the line. My administration have said I have 12 months to save my job. I can't get anything out of this group. Uh, I'm having this kind of tough look in the mirror. Um, what would your starting point be with me or, or what processes would you work around that? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a big thing, right, is uh, so I played college at Wake Forest uh, a little bit earlier than Wells. Um, you know, so I had Walt Chiswick, uh as my head coach and Jay Vidovich. And so um, where, where, where I would start with a coach is, you know, that, that I agree with Wells and I agree with Roy. I, I think it's kind of both, right? It's that you are individually like Wells and I, and you, Gary, if we're playing, we are always responsible for ourselves, right? I'm responsible to come ready to play. I'm responsible to be focused. I'm responsible, you know, to put in a hard effort and to have a plan for what I'm going to do to be successful, what I'm going to do to manage my setbacks, right? I think that's a personal responsibility, especially at that level, right? A player has. And to me, the coach's job is to get more out of me than I can get out of myself, right? So, okay, Brad, you can do this. But Brad, we can get you to do more, right? Or get me more consistent or help me grow, right? So I think a coach's job. So if a team is just kind of quit on a coach, they're disconnected from the coach, that I think it's like, you know, that that coach's challenge is to figure out how do I connect with these people? And I think that, you know, as coaches talk about, you know, the hard skills and the soft skills, right? If your if your players think that it's about you and your ego and it's about you advancing and you looking better and I've got 12 months to turn this around and my job's on the line and my players don't trust me, good luck with that, right? So, you know, you need to find a way to have your players invest in you, right? Are you credible, right? Are you somebody that they think can make you better individually, you better as the team? Are you someone they can count on? You're consistent. You're not going to one day say, here's how we do it. Next day we do it this way. And do you value me? So I would say starting with building that trust, right? So having credibility, being reliable to them, having that connection, you know, that, that trust equation then over divided by that self-interest, right? Um, you might have heard uh, Bill Best put it together as a coaching term. I heard this on a podcast. You loved it, right? He was like, coaches have to be credible. The players need to believe that you can be better individually and better as a team. You're reliable. You're going to be their first one in, last one out. You're consistent in your message and your that intimacy. You care. You genuinely care about my well-being and want to make me better. You divide that over self-interest. If the coach is like, it's about me, my contract, my ego, then, you know, players kind of go, okay. Right. But if it's like I'm investing in you. So I think what I'd recommend is having that coach figure out how to build some trust. Right. Does he have credibility? Does you know, did, did, where is that? Is that lost? How do we rebuild that? How do you become more reliable? And then how do you develop that connection with your players? Right. And, and what does that look like? So to me, it's those soft skills is where I would start um, because it's the coach's job to help that team be better. Obviously, individual pieces and get more out of the individual players. And if they're kind of disconnected, um, and I played for coaches sometimes, I respected they were my coach, but I didn't play for them. I played for me. And I played for coaches where I'm playing for that coach and me, right? And I think that that's how you go about trying to establish that connection, especially now, maybe back in the day. I mean, I played in, you know, 88 to 93. Um, but nowadays, I think the, the, the ability to connect is so much more important, right? To feel valued, to feel cared for. And then you can ride and push people. But if you just jump into ride and push people without that, it's easy to disconnect from them. Yeah, and vice versa. So it's it doesn't negate the player's responsibility to motivate and drive themselves, right? Like I can't – if I have a bad game, I can't come off the field and be like, well, the coach sucked, he didn't motivate me, right? Like – it, it just doesn't work that way. And another parenting phrase that, that I just that I, I think of all the time is more is caught than taught. Right. Like I want to sit my kids down and give them an hour lecture of why they should do something. Um, but that's not really what they hang on. They hang on like how I'm acting and how I'm operating. So uh, first of all, if the coach wants to, to motivate his team, if he wants to um, show that he cares about his players, if he wants to show that he believes in the team, like 
he's got to operate that. I mean, I've, you know, not to crap on coaches. Coaches is a difficult profession for sure. Um, and I will argue with people that say it's easy. So, you know, I had coaches that would say great things, great things. Like let's go during the week, let's play with freedom, right? Who cares if we make a mistake, right? And then when it came to game time, it was, and so I play, I, I played the majority of my career out wide. And so I, you know, I would be on the sidelines. And uh, I, this is why I resonated with Drew's um, podcast you had. And I thought that was brilliant. You know, like, and then he would be t- like, pass it here, pass it there. And you're like, I can't even think. Like, could you just sit down? Because you're, you're, you're totally not saying, or you're totally not acting in the way that you said everything all week. Right. So, um, again, you know, talk is cheap. Uh, so it does, I, I just want to throw that caveat in there that it doesn't negate the player's responsibility to, and you talk a lot about culture, right? So developing that culture, it's not just on the coach, it's on the players as well. And that's one thing that I, as I look back at my career, I wish I had a bigger influence on the pro game is very different from the uh, club. If you're playing with all your friends going up and then it's different from high school, if you're playing high school and it's very different from college. So going from a Wake Forest family environment to a pro environment was extremely difficult. Um, but we all have influence and we all have the ability to influence that culture. So we have to we have to shine the light on ourselves and say, are we contributing to this? Or are we just coming off the field? Because the funny thing about that coach I was telling you about that would always yell at us during the games was the whole team throughout the year would talk about, man, why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? But no one ever brought it to his attention. And so finally, I was like, this is ridiculous. I can't, I can't live with myself if I'm just jabbing behind his back but never say anything. And so I stood up and went team practice and said something. I was like, coach, man, all, everything you say is great, but you got to do it during the game, right? Like, l- let's practice what you preach sort of thing. And that's, again, that's life that's hard for all of us to do. We'll just take a quick break here. Thank you so much for watching the content at Modern Soccer Coach. If you would like to support what we're doing and help us provide more free coaching education with the webinars and the podcasts and everything else, please take a look at this offer that we have from the webinars over the summer. Coaches can now download every single webinar tactical presentation that we did from the lockdown period over the summer. Just over $1 per webinar. You can personally download all 25 webinars that will be yours to keep. Each webinar is over one hour long and features a detailed presentation followed by live Q&A with the coaches in attendance. We cover topics such as youth and elite player development, sports science, tactical analysis, match preparation, goalkeeper pressing and other key specific areas. We had coaches such as Jesse Marsh, Nolan Sheldon, Ivan Beregi, Adin Osman Basic, Oliver Gage, Jonas Munkfall, Kat Smith, John Wall and many more. ModernSoccerCoach.com slash shop. You can go there, get yours now. Support Modern Soccer Coach. Help us provide free content with our webinars and podcasts throughout the year. Thank you. Um, Just along those lines, another... I suppose talking point over the the whole lockdown, which seems to be, you know, we're all we're all watching documentaries, and yeah. some of them, fortunately enough, they're outstanding. Another clip that I uh, I was going to put up, and then I thought the language is too loud, I can't do it. Um, the Amazon documentary with with Jose and Spurs. Um, okay. Something really interesting in that was was the fact that he he seemed to be trying to communicate. I think Mourinho was a genius in so many ways and, and a genius with his communication, but he seemed to be trying to be communicate that his team were obviously falling short in the performances towards the end of the season. He felt that a certain type of person would would carry them. Basically, if, if they stopped being so nice and started being different types of people, they would improve their performances. Um have you ever, would you ever recommend a coach tries to change the personality of the player? Can nice guys win? Like, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll jump in here, Well, so, so I'm a Spurs fan, so uh, we can all grow and change. 
right? We can all, it just takes two things, right? Are we willing to work hard and be open to strategies? You know, as a psychologist, I have people, I work with couples sometimes or families and somebody's like, well, I am who I am. So I don't know why you brought me here. I mean, you knew it when you married me. So this is what you got, take or leave it, right? And what that really is out of fear, right? Somebody's afraid they're not going to be able to grow in the way they want. They're going to let someone down. It's easier just to kind of like say, this is who I am. So I don't have to like try to step outside of my comfort zone and those types of things. So with a player, I think you want to meet them where they are. You got to join them, right? And go with what their motivation is. So uh, for example, so I, you know, uh, when I was at Wake and we were kind of friends, they would go, oh, you're a really nice guy, Brad. You know what I mean? I was a very for- friendly, warm guy. So what position did I play? I played center back or defense. And when I was growing up as a youth, I was the true sweeper. I don't really have them anymore, right? But I was a true sweeper. It was like, I'm taking care of the team. You know what I mean? Like that was it, right? And I was a nice guy, but I would freaking go head to head and go up against anybody because I was protecting my team. I didn't get yellow cards. I didn't yell at people and cuss them out. I would just laugh and they would, you know, do that kind of stuff. But my personality was I was a caring guy. So I'm caring for my team. That allowed me to play aggressive. Do you know what I mean? And play hard because it was within that context. So if a coach is like, Miller, Miller. Okay, I'll tell you a true story. So we're playing against the top of my buddies this couple weeks ago. So my, uh, uh, one of my roommates at uh, Wake was from Philly, right? It's typical Steve Gilmore. Love you, Gilly. And so we're playing in a, in a spring game against UNC Charlotte, and I'm marking this guy. And he's, you know, I'm like probably about 195, 200. He's like, you know, about a buck 50. And he comes for a throw, and then he sprints across half the field to go for a throw. And so I'm running real fast, and he stops. And I just truck him. I just lay him out, right? And so I go, hey, sorry about that. And my teammate goes, Miller. Don't you effing ever apologize again. I'm like, F you, Gilly. He's like, F you, Miller, right? So it's like he was trying to get that, but that wasn't my personality, right? I would pick that guy up, but then I would hammer him, do you know what I mean, when it was like, you know, clean play. Does that make sense? So that's my personality. So I think that you got to take what that person is and build on it, right? It's kind of the blind side, right? They take the guy and go, hey, you got to block for the quarterback. He's your buddy. You got to protect him, man. And all of a sudden, right, he's protecting the quarterback. I think you got to take a player where they are. I think when you try to get them too far out of who they are, you're going to lose them, right? It's too big of a leap. But everybody can learn to be more aggressive. Everybody can learn to be less aggressive. They can be a little bit more, you know, uh, tenacious and kind of like, you know, be a little more tempered, right? You can, so you can do those things within who they are. And that, I mean, coaching is an art. Psychology is an art. Parenting is an art. Almost everything is an art, right? We have some sort of, uh, you know, foundational knowledge that's with that, but it's really the art of that. So my personal perspective is you take this, it's like take Wells, right? If you've ever seen Wells' clips, Wells is like relentless. He is relentless, man. He is like, I don't care who you are. I'm going to go toe to toe and that ball is mine. I will freaking run you down for 25 yards and we're going to go after it. I'm getting that ball. So if you go to Wells and go, hey, Wells, dude, Gotta lighten up, man. Relax, buddy. We got a whole game. You don't spend yourself in the first, you know, you're running 50 yards, you know, sprints, you know, in the first five minutes, bro. We got 90 minutes. That's not going to work for him, right? But if you're like, hey, Wells, if you want to be able to be in that spot at the 89th minute and be that tenacious player you are when we need you in that last, you know, four or five minutes in stoppage time, you just got to pace yourself a little bit more, right? I love how you do that. And this is how we're going to use it, right? So you take those skills and try to highlight what you need from them within that. But if it's like, well, dude, just chill, relax, dude, that isn't going to work. So that's kind of my perspective on sort of where we try to move people as far as from their personality to kind of changing some to fit the better needs of the team. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. interesting. And, and I go back to, to, to Drew's conversation earlier uh, in one of the previous podcasts is, what is what is Mourinho doing in practice? Is he is this a message that he is encouraging a practice for guys to kind of get after it more and have a little grit, and have edge? Uh, I was talking to a buddy of mine today. I mean, I, I, you know, I can't tell you how many Pablo Mastroini, Taylor Twelman, like they would tell me to calm down in practice. And I'm like, calm. What do you mean calm down? Like, what do you mean? I, I, I got I don't know another way sort of thing. And so, I, you know, I, I love this question. I gravitated to the physical part of the game. I played ice hockey growing up. I spent the majority of my time in the penalty box. I freaking loved it. Like I would intentionally sometimes go out there and try to get into it with someone just so it pissed me off because I felt like I played better. Um, you know, so uh, going back to the question, that was a little side note, but um, 
You know, the joke is I actually lead the NCAA in most red cards and yellow cards. It is yet to be proven, but that's what all my college teammates say. Um, but again, I think is, is Mourinho reiterating this in practice? Is he encouraging the guys to do in practice or is it just kind of coming out of the blue sort of thing? I agree with Brad. Brad. I think people can change. I think again, a little bit, it, it comes down to desire. How much do you want to win? And I think that the more that a, a coach can motivate his team, I think the more that again, going back to culture, cause you talk about culture a lot. I love that because it's so important. Like we won the MLS Cup in 2010. No one ever thought we were like the second to last seed going in. We just had a bunch of really good guys that liked each other, right? Like we enjoyed being around each other. There were no big, there were no huge egos. And I had that on other teams, like great teams that didn't, didn't, never won an MLS Cup, right? So, you know, what's the culture like? Are guys believing in each other? Are they fighting for each other? And again, extremely difficult at the pro level, but and especially at, you know, Mourinho at Spurs, but um, that would be a question that that's kind of a thought that comes to mind. Is the culture good? Do they care? Cause at the end of the day, that's kind of what desire is. It's caring. It's fighting for your brothers. It's winning. It's feeling valued. A, a lot of the interpersonal things that you talk about that don't really have to do anything with X's and O's. All right. Last one. I suppose to, we've talked about the, the older age groups a fair bit. Let's say now, I'm a director of a of a club, our youth coach, and I'm right. Like I, I want to teach. I want part of our curriculum, program, philosophy, whatever you want to call it. Part of that is to develop resilience, and mental skills in young players. Uh, we want to take them to to places and help them deal with it, and et cetera, et cetera. That will that will ultimately require some uh, buy-in from parents who are going to see their children. Well, as you mentioned about the setbacks that, that your child was having with baseball. So, and I'm getting ready for it as well. When a parent is, is going, and this can be, and I've seen this from, uh, I've, I've witnessed this from philosophy say like, all right, well, you know, we want to play a better brand of soccer at this club. Well, we lose two games trying to play. We get beat by football team. I get 20 emails. I like screw this. We'll just compete and we'll get better next year. And that seems to be how it goes. So what, how does a DOC deal with this? Uh, what are some ways that you would help them? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? So, uh, so uh, if you, for the listeners here, um, we just made a video um, that I made called Three Ways Parents Can Build Grit in Their Kids. So on our Soccer uh, Resilience YouTube channel. And, you know, one of the things I, as I talk in the video a little bit, so uh, Gary, my son is a junior, my daughter is the sophomore, right? And they play club soccer from a young age, one of the big clubs here in San Diego. And so, you know, seeing all kinds of things. And there was a ton of things I did as a parent that were things that I wish I'd done differently. Like I regret, right? Like having those comments like, did you have fun? Well, how come you didn't run? Right. How come you let him buy you? Like, you know, that guy, you're fast. And they go, why'd you let him beat you? Right. All those kind of things. Right. It's like you have all these thoughts pouring through your head and I would just reel them off. And I go, oh my God, you're a horrible person. Are you driving home? You're like, don't say it, Brad. Don't say it. I'm like, did you have fun today? Yeah, it was a good game. Uh huh. How do you think it went? I went pretty good. And I wake five minutes and go, so uh, what happened on that second goal? Right. And I know it's like unhelpful. Right. And so what I've learned over time, and this is a thing I really, that Wells and I really want to do with parents is, we focus so much on the mistake in our head, right? We have anxiety as parents. You want your kids to do well. You want them to have fun, to be successful and to reach their potential. And I think all of us sometimes as parents, especially with younger parents, I think you believe your kids have more potential than they really do. And as they start getting older and older, you realize as a parent, you have way less to do it. That's up to them, right? But when they're like six, seven, eight, it's like, no, no, everything is kind of on the line. So what I've learned as a parent is I really try to focus on how do they recover? Right. How do they recover from the mistakes? So a wonderful way to build resilience. Parents can do this. And what directors of coaching can do is that they can help, you know, have these talks, meetings with parents. So if we came alongside a club and we would have a parent meeting, we'd have these discussions and say, parents, here's the challenge for you. If you want your child to get better, they're going to have setbacks. They're sometimes not going to play. They're sometimes going to make a mistake. They're going to give up a goal. They're going to miss a goal. They're going to miss the PK. They're going to be the cause of the PK. And these things are going to happen. So I want you to predict this, parents, and have a plan how you're going to manage your anxiety. And how you're going to do that partly is seeing when they make a mistake, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to then remind myself, 
let's focus on how they recover. So um, an example I shared in the video is so my daughter's playing this game. It's a big tournament in the summer. If they win, they're going to the finals, right? She's playing in the back. Ball comes to her. She wins it and she, she wins the header and it's going upper 90, upper 90, and it's in the goal, Gary, but it's in her own goal, right? And my heart just sinks for her. I'm like, oh, right? And I can feel the tension. I kind of, you know, flip my lid. My emotional brain's run the show. Feelings become facts. And now I'm like, oh, man, great. Here we go. I'm like, the coach is going to yank her. She's going to feel horrible. A teammate's going to be mad her. The parents are looking at me like, why'd your kid do that? And I feel all those things. And I go, no, dude, what does she do next? And I watch her. And she shakes it off. You know what I mean? She's locked in, eyes forward, got her feet going. She's ready to go. And she keeps playing. And she actually plays better the rest of the game. And I'm feeling so proud of her. Like, man, I know how hard that is because I've done that before. I've defended her all my life. I know that feeling and she sticks with it. And so I'm like, this is so great. So I'm really, I've trained my brain to focus on what she does next. And so the game's over and she walks over and she's like, so uh, you like how I put that in upper 90, dad? And I kind of go, yeah, that was pretty funny, right? But Gary, there are these thoughts going through my head like, yeah, you didn't square your body. How hard is that? The ball comes, if you squared your body, it goes over the sideline, it's done. But you didn't square your body, so that's why it goes and it went up upper 90, right? You know this. How many, right? All those thoughts are pulling through my head, and I'm like, no, don't say it. Focus, and I go, you know what? I'm so proud of you. When you gave up that goal, you know what I saw you do? You kept working. I couldn't even tell you gave up an own goal, and you actually got better, and I'm so proud of you. And what that does for her now is she goes, oh, it's okay to make mistakes. My dad values much more what do I do next? And I think that that's a message we can send. And then kids fear mistakes less. And we as parents can actually enjoy the game more because we're focused on how they recover instead of fearing and dreading them making a mistake. And of course they do. And it's like, uh oh. So directors of coaching, I think it would be wonderful for coaches to have that same information. Hey, what do you do, especially with youth players? Right. It's a learning process. What do you do when your kid gives up a goal? Do you start yelling at the kid? What are you thinking? What are you doing? Right. Or are you giving them instruction? You know, hey, show me how you respond. Show me how you respond. I'm looking for you, Brad. How are you going to respond, Brad? And then I go and go, Brad, I love it. I love it. That's how we respond. Guys, that's how we respond. Let's go. And now, oh, I walk through a wall for that coach. Are you kidding me? I just had an own goal. And his response was, Brad, show me how you respond. And I keep working and he praises me. Dude, I'm, I'm with you for life. Right. And I think there's a lot of things like that coaches can do. It's like, how do they respond, especially with kids? Because they're so afraid of making mistakes. I've seen my kids play on teams and it's like they're all tight. And I'm like, what's going on? Well, the coach is like joystick. It's like you make a mistake in the first two minutes. OK, so and so is warming up. So and so is warming up. And you're like, that's it. Like kids need to learn how to push. That's not building resilience. Right. That's fearing kids to make mistakes. Instead, it's like, I'm going to keep you in. I want to see what you do. But when a kid comes off and goes, hey, you know what? Today's not your best game, Brad. You've been struggling, but you know what? You hung in there. I kept you and I wanted to see if you could hang in there and you did. And I'm proud of you for that. And if you do that for young kids, they play more free. The anxiety is lower. And Gary, you know, as well as we all know, when we're less focused on how we look and how we're doing, we have way more focus on the game. We execute better. We play better and we work harder. So as the director of coaching, I would love to see coaches get that message about ingraining kids it's how you respond it's how you respond and how you respond versus let's just get mad at them for a mistake it's like as a parent when i'm having a lazy parent moment gary you know what i do why'd you do that that's great that's yeah. completely helpful i see coaches all the time i'll walk around tournaments and coaches will be like well okay what's miller doing out there why is brad doing that he didn't learn anything except coaches pissed at me and now i'm kind of freaked out to make a mistake right so even coaches who take a player out and go, I love it when they go, hey, Brad, you know, I pulled you out. OK, what happened there? Right. OK, what what could you have done instead? Right. OK, hey, take a breather. Collect yourself. I want to watch the game, get in the flow of the game, see what I'm looking for. And I'm going to have give you a chance to come back. And when I do, I'm going to look for you to do that thing we just talked about. OK. And those kind of things are huge for youth players. Right. Because there's so much about the coaches feel pressure. Um, my friend uh, was, was was talking about youth clubs, and he goes, he's like, how's your son's new coach? And I go, yeah, he's good. He's like, oh, I kind of heard he can be kind of loud and kind of yell. And I go, oh, he seems nice. He goes, well, you haven't had any games yet, right? He's like, yeah, coaches are great until the games start, right? There's so much pressure on youth coaches. And in my kids, I've been super blessed. I've had wonderful youth coaches. They really have. It's been great. 
but there's so much pressure, right? You have to win. You have to win. And I think coaches need to decide what's their culture. Are they going to focus on development and winning, or is it really just winning? Right. Because I don't think there's anything wrong with focusing on winning, but you want to focus on development, too. Right? I don't think they're kind of an either or proposition, but a lot of times it really is just winning. Yeah. You know, what? OK, we're going to play build out of the back and do that until the last 20 minutes. And we're just sending everything along because, you know, Wells is up top. Who's faster? Everybody will score two goals and we'll win two to one. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Are, are you talking just from a club perspective, Gary? Is that the question? No, well, any any direction you want to move with it, Wells. If you want to move with it with a with a coach or the club as a whole or anything at all, really. Yeah, I, I kind of got your question from like a youth club perspective, and so I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say I'm one jacked up individual. I got a lot of issues. You can ask my wife. You can ask everyone who knows me. Uh, so I don't pretend to be an expert in the in the youth club system. You know, I've got my own experiences in that. Um, when I retired, I coached for a season in a local club here. Uh, and it's extremely difficult. Like, I think, again, it goes back to what you're so focused on is culture, right? So I think for the DOC, um, um, it needs to be owned and he needs to emphasize it throughout the whole organization. And so I think it needs to be, again, um, reiterated, reemphasized and, and modeled, right? Like, and, and celebrated and, um, so the club I coached at, it was the culture was just yell at the kid, yell at the kid. And, and the team loved it when they heard that an MLS former MLS guy was coming to coach their team. But when I didn't yell during the games, they hated me. They were like, why is this guy not yelling and telling my players where to be? And my whole philosophy was like, and yes, I did talk during the games, but my whole philosophy was like, this is what we work on in practice in the game. I don't need to tell little Johnny to move two feet to the right. Like, he, you know, he's got he's got to figure it out somehow. And so I think if you establish that culture, and again, maybe it goes back to coaching education. I, I don't have all the answers. I have a lot of the answers, but um, it's emphasizing. And so a lot of these like lower tier club coaches, their their parents or um, you know they, it's their second job, and so life's taken over. And um, you know, so maybe it's it's more of a kind of leadership issue if directors of coaching really do value this sort of thing because. I believe they need to um, because at five and six years old, we need kids to understand that we want them to take risks and to have courage. Um, and so one of the things I struggled with, it was like, I felt all this pressure to like yell at my kids and to conform to every other coach in the club. Again, I know I'm going back to Drew again, but he talked about courage, having the courage um, to, um, kind of live out your beliefs and your values and, and your kind of coaching philosophy, whatever that is. But um, yeah, I think that it, it serves the kids tremendously well just for them to understand that it's supposed to, yeah, especially from a young age, this is fun. And yes, you want to learn the game. And yes, I believe we want to teach our kids to win, right? But especially when they're younger, we want to teach them um, playing different positions, um, you know, how to take kids on and do step over so that they can implement those skills in the game. Um, and again, going back to more is caught than taught. If the DOC can model it and can continue to emphasize it with his, um, you know, his staff, then the more that there's going to be buy-in from the whole club. And again, just communication, right? Good communication is the cornerstone of every good relationship. And I know that's so difficult for coaches because they have so many people pulling at them. Um, but it's just communicating with the parents and understanding that it is their very emotional because it's their thing that they created that's out there running around playing. Um, so, yeah. Fantastic. Guys, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. We appreciate what you do, man. And just the fact that like, look, I'm, you know, you're, you talk about lifelong learner and I'm just really kind of understanding what that is because all I cared about was soccer and I'm like there's a big world out there and I need to learn more and uh, so that's cool because I think that the older we get sometimes we can get set in our ways and and not be open to things so I appreciate you setting the example in that sense no no thank you thank you no I I think I said I I I haven't worked in youth sports in 10 odd years I don't pretend to be an expert in youth sports but I'm probably more passionate now about how they should be structured and and how damaging they can become if they're not uh by by almost 
a reverse engineering it and starting at the top and looking at what we need to create on the way down. So like I'm I'm buzzing about what you guys are. I think I think learning to deal with adversity and not I don't think we ever embrace it, right? But I think mm-hmm. uh, if we become a little bit more comfortable with it, I do believe like it's like with with both of your definitions at the start, they're both kind of consistent in the theme of that the plane takes off against the wind and and I think that's a that's such a powerful message for for young players today that are that are learning about professional life through Instagram wells. They're not they're not reading yeah. the autobiographies. They're they're looking at pictures and and those pictures are endorsements. It's not real life. Blah blah blah. So I think we're where people like yourselves are are getting in the trenches with coaches and teams and that are are working on this here. I think it's huge. So anything I can do to help, please let me know and. I wish you all the best, and I look forward to following it. Yeah, right yeah. back, brother. Excited to see your journey with your kids too. 